Welcome to the Work Joy Jam podcast. I'm your host, Beth Stallwood. And every week I am joined by a person from the world of work who has a perspective on work joy. And today I am joined by the wonderful Sarah Browning. She is the founder of the Time for Kindness program and a kindness cheerleader and communicator. And she helps organizations, especially in the not-for-profit world, find ways to communicate their kindness stories. And I think this subject is so important when we think about work joy and they're really, really related. This idea of noticing kindness when we see it, of sharing it when we see it, of thinking the kindest possible way that we could do something, even when those things might be really, really tough. So I really hope you enjoy this conversation. I know I did. Welcome to the Work Joy Jam podcast. I am very excited today to be joined by the wonderful Sarah Browning. And Sarah and I met a few months ago. I can't even remember how, via some kind of mutual something or other, I'm sure. And I asked Sarah to come on because I think she's got some really interesting things to talk about, especially in the world of kindness, which is something I think we all need more of in our lives. But rather than me introduce Sarah properly, I'm going to hand over to you. Sarah, can you tell us who you are? I feel like Scylla Black, like who you are, what you do and how your career got you to where you are today. Absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. It's uh, very uh, exciting to be here. And, and as you say, I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about all sorts of things, but kindness is one of my favourite topics. So it will be great to talk about it. Um, but in terms of my career, so I had a very academic education, which worked really, really well for me. I like I liked, I like learning. So that was fantastic. And it, but it was set up a little bit more to sort of take you on to the next step. So it meant that I went to university to do my favourite school subject. And then uh, when I graduated, I had no idea what I wanted to do uh, for a proper job. Um, so I went travelling. <laughs> yeah, you know. just, just um, ignore the question. <laughs> and then, but then I came back um, and my first job, because um, I needed some money really, uh, was as a pensions administrator for a, a big financial company, which was not something I dreamed of, but in actual fact gave me a really good opportunity to have a look around and see what do people do? in work mm. there. Um, and from there I discovered uh, what turned out to be the internal communications team and that became my job basically and and um, I did that for many years first of all uh, at the, the financial company and then when I left there I went to Cancer Research UK and was also in, in the internal comms team there and I had always loved stories and writing and, and that sort of thing so it, it was and my degree was languages so it, it was all quite natural and when I left Cancer Research UK I decided to set up my my own business and because I'd been working in the, the charity sector I carried on working with not-for-profit organizations and helping them to be effective in their communication and beyond their internal comms but to connect with all sorts of different audiences and that's what I've continued to do up until today. The last couple of years that has also evolved to be thinking about I got to thinking about, I talked about my clients wanting a better, or having a vision, I suppose, of, of a better world. And I got to thinking, but what do I mean by that? And that's when the kindness started to sort of be articulated, I suppose, when I realised that I mean a kinder world. And beyond that, I believe there's lots of kindness in the world already. I just don't think we talk about it enough. And so the Time for Kindness programme, which I now run alongside my communications work, is all about amplifying and sharing stories of the kindness that already exists in the world. And that's about giving people positivity, hope in a world that, let's be honest, doesn't always give it to us. Um, but it is there and we need to train ourselves to notice it more. So true. And I'm really interested in it. And there's so many things I want to pick up on as well. So are you all right if I dive in with some thoughts and some questions? Please do. I love it how our careers start out in the most random possible way. And I, I, I it was listening to your career about, you know, I started as a pension administrator because it was a job and it got me looking at stuff. I started out in a call centre, an investment company. I had no idea what was going on. And then you find your niche. And I I suppose rather than a question, it's more of a, a statement that I wanted to make to our listeners, especially if they are early on in their careers or thinking about their careers, or if they've got, you know, we've got a lot of people who have probably got kids who are about to think about what do they want to do and where do they want to go, is we don't all have nice, neatly planned out careers. 
where we start isn't always where we end up. And it's so interesting, isn't it, about finding a job and then seeing where it leads you to and all these great things that have come from you starting there. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, my, my job title now uh, is a, as a kindness cheerleader and communicator. And, and there was just no way that uh, uh, pretty much certainly not at school and, and certainly the early years of my career that anyone would have said to me, ha, I know what you should be. You should be a kindness cheerleader. <laughs> it's something that, that you can kind of create as you, you go along. And I think you're right that if we're not careful, we can get a bit set in on a track and then at a much further you know, point along that track think, hang on a minute, is this really where I want to be? Mm. So, so kind of trying to look up every now and again and, and think, actually, when I got my first job, actually, in internal communications at the pensions company, it was because I noticed that there were some people doing it. And frankly, I talked to anyone who would listen, my boss, their boss, all sorts of people say, oh, that looks really interesting. I'd like to do that. And when an opportunity came up, they gave it to me, I think, to keep me quiet as much as anything. Yeah. You know, actually being an annoying advocate for yourself and wanting to do something can be very, very helpful. Uh, And making yourself known, making your ambitions known, saying, actually, I'm really interested in this. I want to go here. I want to see about this is a great way of getting people to think about you when those opportunities come up. So it has a, whether they give it to you because of any reason or because they want to keep you quiet, who cares? If you get the job, you get to do something and you can work through it. I also love what you're saying there about this idea that if we get too structured about it, we can get on a path that maybe isn't our own path. And we, I always think about it as like Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz, we like end up following a yellow brick road and then looking up and going, oh, I'm not sure this yellow brick road was what I really wanted to do. It was just where this more traditional career path took me or where I thought I wanted to be, but actually things have changed over time and I want to do something different now. Yeah, exactly. And and I think, you know, right from the, that sort of early day, those early days, I have, and it may be because I'm, you know, fortunate to have this sort of personality. And, and like I mentioned, you know, right at the start of this talk, I've always enjoyed learning. Mm. I've talked about things, you know, that I'm genuinely interested in. You know, I, I was saying to people at, at work at that time, oh, that looks really interesting. I want to do that. Not because I thought it was the right thing to say, or even that it would be a step on a ladder. I just was genuinely interested and thought, oh, that looks fun. That looks like it would be joyful. So yeah. I have expressed it in that way at that time, but it certainly was something that, that interested me. And I, I couldn't, if I, hindsight's a wonderful thing, isn't it? But <laughs> my other sort of roles in my career and so on, it has all been driven by things that have genuinely been of interest to me. That isn't to say I've been happy every day and I've always loved everything I've done, but broadly speaking, it's been things that that um, I have have wanted to do more of and wanted to explore and find interesting. Yeah, and I always talk about, uh, when I talk about careers with people, is like follow the joy, follow what your curiosity, follow what you're excited about. And that doesn't have to be forever. You could do that for a while and then find the new thing that yeah. you're excited about. And actually, if we think about it, if we're projecting so much into the future about what we might be doing in our careers in the future, I mean, the robots are coming to get some of those jobs. So some of these jobs won't exist in the future that very much exist now and some of the new jobs will come up like a kindness cheerleader did not exist when I was at school nobody said I could do that as a job although I reckon I would be pretty good at it I think so (laughs) I think you already are (laughs) (laughs) are. yeah (laughs) no no career advisor ever said to me that I could be a cheerleader so but I can be I can be whatever I want to be um I love that So I've got loads more questions, probably not quite as career related, but I'd love to talk a little bit more about um, the kindness side of things. So can I dive into some questions around kindness? Absolutely. First of all, I just want to say, I think you're absolutely right that there is actually a lot of it already, a lot of it. But I don't know about you. I have been, especially in the last few years, I've been really switched off from things like the news, from things like Twitter, yeah, from things that say it's news and newsworthy and for me there's just been way too much negativity and a lot of looking at the worst side of life involved in some of those platforms and I think and I I'm pro I, I imagine you will tell me the truth here and about the facts and stuff but I think if we were to actually sometimes shine a lens on the other side of life we could actually really help 
work out some of the problems that are genuine problems and issues uh, yeah absolutely and and I think <clears throat> you're not alone there was some research that came out last week I think wasn't there of of, of the numbers of and of people that are actively turning away from sort of certainly the traditional news and have been mm. there the last few years because as you say there is there is such a lot of negativity to it and I always say with the time for kindness work that I do I'm not about denying that side of things clearly there's some awful stuff that that goes on in the world but that's not the only story and my my worry is that that it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy if that's all we hear and that's all we see and people retreat because they think oh those people over there are not kind therefore I'm not going to be kind and it sort of becomes entrenched but I don't think we're there yet not by a long chalk and I think you know we we need to redress that balance so that we are telling Mm the other side of the story as well and 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 I kind of I see all those negative things and I think but that's not who we are most of us the vast majority of us would choose to do something kind would go and help a neighbor with their shopping or you know whatever it might be if we saw them drop something and so I think we need to remind ourselves that the time for kindness work that I do is all about sharing real examples of kindness real stories so things that are actually happening rather than sort of motivating with positive quotes I think there's a place for those absolutely but that isn't what time for kindness is about it's about saying look it is there let's let's see it let's and the more you notice it the more you see it so yeah. that becomes then a self-fulfilling prophecy in the other direction in a more <laughs> positive way <laughs> yeah and I'm just gonna for a minute you and if it's okay indulge in the kind of work joy work gloom side of life uh, to um, relate to this is that we all have negativity bias in our minds already. So we are, as human beings, drawn to the negative because it's about our safety and our kind of well-being and our survival and all that kind of stuff. We're very deeply drawn to look at it and make mountains out of molehills on the bad stuff that could have an impact on our lives. And actually, one of the things we talk about in the work joy world is if you focus more on the joy, the gloomy side of things tends to feel more manageable and this isn't about that toxic positivity stuff and it's not about saying oh isn't everything wonderful when it's not it's about saying hang on a minute there is some good stuff over here and if I focus on the good stuff I feel better able to manage the stuff that isn't so good I feel better able to engage in my work I feel better able to um, understand what I can do to stop bad things happening again or to be able to understand that that's just part of life and kind of deal with it and I'm imagining it feels similar in the kindness world is that actually if we focus on some of those things we'll see it more think about it more do it more rather than think nobody's doing it therefore I shouldn't bother absolutely and it's interesting because quite often people will will quote at me you know that sort of research around oh well we're, we're pre um preconditioned to you know look out for the fight flight you know safety and all of that sort of stuff there is actually an emerging body of research around um that that isn't necessarily true and that actually you know to to survive on the the wild plains millions and millions of years ago people needed to work together and Mm. do things for each other and for me I think quite often this idea and I think you're right particularly in a, in a work context or often in a work context and a leadership um, context people will say or, or, or perhaps be concerned that kindness is some sort of weakness and therefore sort of pull away from it I believe the opposite is true I don't think kindness is weak I think it's powerful because I think mm. it makes us as human beings and I think some of that idea that kindness is weak comes from thinking that kindness is the same as niceness and it, uh, yes and it is yes. actually you know being kind isn't always the easy thing to do you know again in that sort of work context sometimes actually the kind thing if you've got somebody in your team that's not performing for example the kind thing is not to let them blunder on and, and perhaps be in a role that is is not suitable for them and also meanwhile everyone else around them in the team is is suffering um, as a result you know the kindest things to do perhaps is to hold them accountable work through what's going on etc and maybe even have to sort of manage them out for want of a bit I hate that phrase but but you, you get my, my, my drift mm. um but but actually you know there are kind ways to do that as well so I think that's where there's there's a again this sort of idea that oh but we're all predisposed to be you know that's the way we're programmed 
yes and no if we are all programmed then that way then I've been programmed wrong <laughs> <laughs> and you know we can we also have the choice to change our programming if yep. your current programming looks like that you can make efforts and do stuff that actually changes that rewrites some of your yes. programming so it's not we're not stuck in that if that's the way, but also if that's the way that we've been brought up, if that's the way that our organizational culture works, if that's the way that our wider culture works is to look at all the bad stuff, of course, we're going to spend more time looking at all the bad stuff. We're not going to look at the good stuff. But if we can really focus and reprogram ourselves to look at some of the good stuff and not ignore the bad stuff, we yeah. can do things. Like it's like a, it's a positive action thing, isn't it? We can go and do some stuff that makes a difference yeah. versus wallowing in a sense of self-pity or... Yeah. a sense of nobody does anything for anyone and I think the word I wrote down while you were talking about that is this kind of sense of community and the sense of helping each other and supporting each other and obviously this happens in bigger pictures in terms of communities outside of work but let's go into kind of the working world and think about how kindness plays out there and I'm thinking you know I could probably think in my working life of something that's happened if I really thought about it, probably at least once a week where someone has done something kind for me. Yeah. But I really have to think about it because I, I, it doesn't automatically come in and kind of label it. And I'm thinking from little things like someone's seen you really busy and they've brought you a coffee over. Like, how kind is that? It's like so, so nice and just supportive to someone helping you out with something, to somebody proofreading something for you. All of this stuff is a real kindness that people can do for you but we probably don't spend enough time thinking about it or noticing it. Absolutely. And I, I think it, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I, I was looking in fairly recently, I was looking into definitions of kindness, mm. all sorts of definitions and no sort of one agreed definition, though there's lots of sort of threads that, that go through different ones. Of course there are. But I think one of the things that can be a bit of a challenge in terms of us noticing, particularly in a, in a work environment, when kindness happens and acknowledging when kindness happens is because we're so busy rushing on to the next thing. Or we, if we do think about it, we think, well, of course, it was Sam's job to help me out with that report. So, so it wasn't a kindness because he had to do it because it was his job. But actually, it, it, for me, I don't think that negates the fact that it's a kindness. So... There are all sorts of different ways that kindness can reveal itself, as it were, in, in a working yeah. world. And I think you're right that that making that conscious choice to notice it, perhaps not in the moment because you are busy because you've got to get the report in and there's a deadline, blah, blah, blah. but whether that be, you know, later in the day, whether it be your monthly team meeting or, you know, some kind of occasion where you consciously stop and think, right, what? has happened what has been kind what has has gone on um that that was a kindness to me or indeed that I did that was a kindness for someone else because also what I'm finding with with my work is that people are sending me stories I'm never going to run out of kindness examples but more often certainly nine times out of ten they will tell me about things that other people have done that have been kind mm. and they don't recognize it in themselves but if you recognize it in yourself that's a big boost as well a big positive boost to to feel that you have done something to make someone else's day better yeah that's so interesting because I'm sitting here reflecting on what you just said about I more often notice it in other people than I do in myself and then I'm thinking does that mean I'm not very kind but I think it's just we're more open to seeing the the great things that other people yeah. do than the great things we do ourselves I think we're quite blind often to our own and that's Good a learned, features. I reckon, and <laughs> this is my purely kind of um, <laughs> anecdotal, not at all <laughs> view, but I think that's probably learned behaviour somewhere along the way. Mm. So, um, last month, I had a stall at a local community festival and we were doing an interactive share your kindnesses all around us, share your story activity. And we had people with post-it notes writing their stories and, and we were getting the kids to draw pictures and so on. And I was saying to the children, oh, you know, we're collecting stories of kind people. Do you know any? Um, and one little girl said, yes, me. <laughs> Oh. And and actually, she wasn't the only. I mean, she was the one who was who was so vocal about it. But actually, she wasn't the only one. And the kids definitely had 
that different way of, of, of looking at it, not being embarrassed that they were kind because if they knew it was a good thing to be. I guess that, you know, as I say, it's completely non-scientific, but it would appear that somewhere along the way we'd learn not to shout about that. <laughs> I think it's probably, and I know I have this one quite strongly, but we have like, um, I have a don't brag about it message that I've definitely yeah. had since child, like don't brag, don't brag yes. stuff. To the point where actually sometimes I don't even tell people good news. Like, I just don't tell anybody things. And you're like, okay, this is a bit silly now. Um, but I, I, I just had that image of that little girl that you said about. And I, like, really want her to keep that yes. and go, yeah, that was me. I was really kind yeah. in that moment. I'm good at this thing. Absolutely. Because it does work both ways, you know. And I think that's another thing that makes kindness powerful, actually, is that it's a really positive thing, both for the person who receives it and the person that gives it. And and therefore, you know, that again makes it strong because it's got that sort of double double aspect. Yeah. And the aspect of also that also joins those two people together as well. Right. So there's something yeah. about the connection and the community and the humanness of it all. Yes. And there's something for me about what you're talking about here is all of this stuff is like it's a deeply human thing to be kind to each other. Yes, I think so. I, I, I absolutely think so. And, and I think, you know, some of that you know as I said you know I'm not denying there's definitely some people and certainly some acts that are very very unkind so it it, it's not um about uh sort of rose-tinted glasses but at the same time the more we have those connections the more we understand other people um as Mm. human beings you know it's the whole sort of um more in common than you know the divides us thing as well and I think it's kind of focusing on those aspects um has, has to be a positive force for the world I'm also kind of sitting here reflecting on especially in like my world of the tougher stuff so the you know the difficult conversations and the it was kinder for that person to give me some feedback about what I could have done better there because it wasn't my best work that's a that's actually it is a kindness it might not feel like it at the time it might feel a little bit I didn't like that but actually it is a kindness to the, I will always remember a situation where I walked out of the toilets at work and had my skirt tucked in my knickers <laughs> and um, the head of legal came up, came up behind me and went, you've got your skirt tucked in your knickers. <laughs> and like, you know, that is a kindness. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, these these so. situations <laughs> of real life that happen. Yeah, absolutely. And I think what's lovely about that example uh, is that it shows that, that, you know, there's a kind way to do it. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm, as you say, it sounds like they came up to you and sort of whispered it to you rather than shouting <laughs> across a shared office of a hundred. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They came up, stood behind me and said, your skirts in your and stood there until I'd sorted it out. Yeah. You know, there was a whole kind situation. I can't believe I've just shared that one on a podcast, <laughs> but that is, I, every time you're talking about it, I'm getting things come to mind. I'm just really hoping that the listeners are thinking about this and all the times, even in your work environment or beyond, because life and work are all part of the same big life thing is I'm hoping everyone's thinking now of some examples of where either they've done stuff that's really kind or where other other people have done stuff that's really kind for them. And so many stories are coming up in my mind. And I just wanted to go back to this um, point about, because I think this probably is a theme across all of your work, isn't it? I'm going to assume is that there's more than one story here. Yes. This isn't the only story we should be thinking about or looking at. And how so often, and I, I, I think time issue is one of the things that makes us get there. I think we get really specialist in our expertise and we get kind of stuck in a bit of thinking. But so often we think there's only one story. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and even for, you know, a, a single given story, there are different angles to it as well. And there are different perspectives to it. They'll mm. view it in different ways. I mean, in the communications work that I do, a big part of that um, is to, to help organisations and individuals to think about what is a situation like for their audience. I used to, yeah. I ch- this is an area I've changed the way I talk about it over the last few years, actually, because I used to say, put yourself in their shoes. But actually, I've changed that because it isn't about how would you feel if you were in that. Mm. It's about what is it like for them? What's their experience? What's their story? You know, and and, and so understanding things again from different perspectives enables you to, I, I guess we're sort of starting to talk about empathy, really, aren't we? You know, it's, it's, it's you don't have to have experienced it yourself to have at least some inkling of what it might be like and, and what therefore impact those experiences may have on the way that somebody 
acts, speaks, behaves, you know, all, all, all that kind of stuff. Um, that That is an important element, I think, of this human connection um, aspect. Yeah. And I am slightly giggling in the background because one of the things I always say to people, when people always say to me, oh, you should put yourself in their shoes is, okay, but one of the big things you have to do is you have to take your own shoes off first. So you have to take off your own perspective and your own understanding of it and actually properly stand with people and understand their experience from their perspective, not from where you come from in yeah. that perspective. Yeah. yeah, I really like that. I've not heard that phrase before. I think yeah. that, that works really well. I don't think it's unique. I don't think I have coined it. I think I have taken it from someone, but I don't know where from. And it was a long time ago that I started using it. So if it, if we know who that is, thank you very much for allowing me to use it because I've used it a lot. And I think as well, if we think about bigger picture things like levels of privilege and understanding and diversity and all of these different things, if we stand in someone else's shoes with our own shoes on, we're not really understanding what's going on. Yes. Yes, exactly. I, I think that that's really true. And, and we can we can lose sight of that, I think, sometimes, can't we? Yeah. And I, I, I'm sitting here thinking about empathy and I, kindness and empathy in my head have some kind of word association relationship with each other. And it's almost like, are they so totally interrelated that you can't have one without another? And I've just gone down a massive rabbit hole now. So <laughs> help me unpick it. Kindness and empathy, can they exist yeah. without each other? Well, there's a question. <laughs> <laughs> and, it, you know, it's because because actually, so so one of the, I, I said earlier that I might be programmed wrong. Um, I think one of, the, one of the ways in which I, the programming I don't have that a lot of people have is I'm quite happy not to have a definitive answer on, on questions like that and not even actually to have, scientific proof and data mm. i'm quite happy that my gut tells me that that your um uh, hypothesis should we call it a hypothesis yeah <laughs> oh we'll get fancy and like we're scientific about it yeah. i'm not very scientific either you know uh, but but I, I i you know that that feels to me like there's a there's a lot of, of truth in that and i think i suppose and i know i've said this a lot already but it, it, i think for me that where it's um got that overlap um, I suppose is is in terms of of, of connection. Um, mm. I don't know if you have to have empathy to be kind, um, because you. I, well, I suppose what I suppose what I, what, it, what it is is that I I'm, I don't know if you have to have empathy for a specific detail of a situation or a person. Actually, mm. it may just be that you have empathy for them as a fellow human being. And therefore, yeah. you want to reach out and, and be kind and, and, and do something um, that makes their day better. Um, yeah, so it's kind of an overarching empathy for other humans versus a, I understand your situation that you're in. I, I, that's my kind of current thinking. I would love <laughs> if any of your listeners have more sort of scientific um, uh, sort of evidence or or, reason yeah. or, or even listening um, about that, then I would love to hear about it because, you know, I think it is, it's, a, it's an interesting topic, isn't it? It's such an interesting topic. And I, I think we could, I could go down many, many, many different rabbit holes with this particular topic. And I, like you, do not possess the scientific um, understanding of the deep <laughs> neuroscience behind it I just know that kindness feels nice when you when someone offers it to you and it feels good when you offer it to somebody else and I kind of go why wouldn't we want more of that goodness in the world yeah, yeah absolutely and I mean you know certainly again you know th there is is growing uh, a growing body of research and evidence in terms of kindness that is showing some of those uh, sort of making those connections I suppose in in a work and, and business context that actually if if you whichever lens is most important to you as a leader whether it's about encouraging a culture of kindness because it's a good human thing to do or whether you are more interested in your business results and your productivity and all of that side of things that kindness culture delivers both of those so yeah the, the, the sort of idea that you know if they've got, you have got that kindness culture then um, the the kind of productivity goes up, the motivation goes up, the wanting to work together, to collaborate, to innovate, you know, all those things, and they will drive your business. So I, like you, come back to thinking, well, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you want to? Yeah. <laughs> like it, there's no downside, is there? I, 
it doesn't seem there is to me no <laughs> I'm trying to think if there is a downside and I, I can't the only thing I can imagine as a downside and, I, and it is the thing that you talked about before is that people assuming that kind equals just being nice and a bit kind of airy fairy about everything yeah. versus the kind of deeper sense of what's the kindest possible thing we could do in this moment how could we do this horrible thing but do it with the most kindness how could we think about this from a kindness perspective so I think it's it's in the misinterpretation where it's not a win-win. Yeah, and I, I think it probably ha- also has something to do with, you know, if you have a culture within your, your business that rewards that sort of individual mindset. Yes. You know, kindness is a collective, you know, talk about connection, but it's also, it, it is a collective thing. But I wonder how much longer that individual mindset is going to last, really, and how much that it's going to sort of continue to serve us all. And that, mm. you know, the, for the, the big challenges you, you mentioned earlier on about, you know, the big challenges that we face um, as a entire world, really, you know, we to, to solve those individuals are not going to solve those. We have to work together. We have to be more collective about it. And so you know that, that those individualistic cultures i hope personally um you know uh, will will go away but if you have got one of those i can see that being kind and getting involved with other people and, and having that sense of oh it's holding me back slowing me down uh, you know that, mm. that's going to feel like a downside isn't it yeah because it'll feel like working against the grain yeah. and it'll feel like you're the odd one out um and that might not feel too good. I mean, I I often feel like the odd one out and kind of use it as a uh, strength, but some people find that really challenging. Yeah. And I think, you know, thinking about kind of this cultural thing, thinking about organisations, thinking about how do we take it and do stuff with it. How would you, because, and I'm asking you this question because almost every organisation I'm working with, in fact, I can't think of one that isn't, says, what do you need in your, you know, your future leaders, your future employees? They say they want innovation. They want collaborative working. They want people to be able to solve bigger problems because they know that in the future, AI is going to solve the kind of smaller, yeah. smaller problems for them, et cetera. So organisations want all of these things. What are some of the kind of key facets that you would see as a real kindness culture? I think it's a lot of what we've talked about already, actually. So I, I think it is about um, thinking about the other people in your culture as mm. people and not just your your team, your people at desks, on screens, you know. That, so that, kind of rehumanising it. Yeah, I, th- I think so. I, I think that that's some of it. I think in terms of communication skills, one of the absolute biggest um, areas for improvement that will deliver some of the things you're talking about is real genuine listening oh, and li- yeah. listening to understand rather than to reply because <laughs> I think that's what we all do I'm guilty of it as much as, as anyone else you know we, we all can fall into that sort of what am I going to say next right you know they've said that so now I'm going to say this or whatever um, whereas the kind of real listening deeply to, to understand and again it comes back to that perspective thing doesn't it um yeah that sort of real un- understanding their perspective their views you know starting with the idea that nobody has come to work to do a bad job yeah you know that that isn't the 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 sort of reality and so listening in that way i think can have probably a bigger impact than, than people even realize and i think i i mean i, I don't Many years ago, um, I, I can't even remember which of my previous um, organisations it was, but, you know, I was sent on some sort of active listening training. Um, and the trouble with that, I think, is that sometimes it can feel quite formulaic. And again, yeah. like you've been taught a process and that can feel quite comforting, actually. You know, I can see why why there is, um, you know, some benefit in something like that, that to give you a bit of structure, a bit of a framework. But I think if you apply it too literally or two, you get so hung up on the process that you yeah. forget to actually listen. Yeah. I know I can be guilty of that as well because I'm not particularly drawn to processes. So I'm it's like I followed my five steps. I must have listened. It's like, oh no, I don't remember a single word anyone exactly. has said. Exactly. I'll just give a little call out. In season one, we had uh, Janie Van Hool come on and she um, has written a book called The Listening Shift. So I'd recommend people go back and listen to that episode. I can't remember the exact one, but I'll put it in the show notes. Um, because actually, 
actually listening is so important. I remember training as a coach and like, I reckon at least 50% of the coach training you do is around actually how to properly listen to people. And I have a a great friend who's also a coach and he always said there's real value in giving people a good listening to. (laughs) And I love that phrase and I use it often having stolen, clearly stolen it from him. Um, But I just think there's something wonderful, isn't there, about being genuinely listened to. Absolutely. And, and, And again, you know, we have to remember that I, you know we're not saying genuinely listen to someone um you know that doesn't necessarily mean you agree with them yeah uh and actually that's okay but like you say it's that feeling genuinely listened to can can have a a, a huge impact yeah there's also I'm just thinking about kind of all those different situations that cause people what I call work gloom and one of the situations I'm thinking of also has an answer to it, which I think I have taken from, I think it's Brené Brown, which is when, you know, when people are really winding you up, uh-huh. which happens in the workplace yeah. and nobody has ever spent their career working and gone, do you know what? No one's ever wound me up. Yeah. Like they've never had like any red flags. I've never felt the red mist rising. Yeah. People get wound up at work. It's a fact. Human beings don't always see eye to eye with things and sometimes things great is that the phrase I think she says is something like this. What's the kindest possible reaction or reason I could give Mm. to this thing? And even that, if you think about it, it might not be that you're perfect. It might not be that you can go, they're not annoying me. Sometimes you're going to be the annoying person too. That's a fact we should always remember. (laughs) But actually, if we are, and I often think about this when someone's winding me up, I kind of go, okay, what's the kindest possible reaction I could have to this? Or what's the kindest possible reason they could be doing this to yeah. and the kindest possible duty they're not doing it deliberately to wind you up um but you know people are in different situations we only ever know kind of five percent of what's going on in anybody's life behind you know behind closed doors there's always stuff that we don't know about we don't understand and for me I find if you're in that situation where you don't really want to be kind to somebody taking a breath and kind of going what is the kindest possible reaction what is the kind of possible reason this could be happening really helps to take the sting out of it a little bit absolutely and I I think it's it's some of um just having as you say a strategy of some sort can be helpful in itself can't it because even having that question to ask yourself Mm. at that moment of pause that kind of take a beat and that in itself can um kind of break the cycle enough uh for you to walk away or you know whatever it might be but to to, to do something different so I think you know having those kind of strategies in your back pocket as it were, <laughs> instead, you know I don't like processes I don't like them with the details, <laughs> but <laughs> having those sorts of things and, and it is a little bit like you know the I've, I've written about kind of exercising your kindness muscle and mm. uh, in in terms of noticing things and consciously deciding to notice what is the kind thing that has happened in this situation. One of my favourite kindness stories that we've shared on Time for Kindness was somebody um, was at a shopping mall, the doors, there was only one set of doors that were working, and there was a um, uh, an, an older lady trying to come through the other way, and people were streaming through, and she couldn't get through. And then the person that sent in the story kind of stopped and did let the old lady to come out, and it would be really easy in that situation to look at all the ones who didn't stop and be, well, of course, that's it, isn't it? No one's kind to anyone else anymore. Although that's typical. That's how things are. But somebody did stop. So actually, let's look at them. Let's have that strategy to think, what is the kind thing that has happened here? And let's look at that. Yeah. And I love that. It's like, just because other people didn't do it doesn't mean that doesn't take anything away from the person that did. Yes. We can still give them props and actually that person doing that the next time those people see something happening like that they might do it because they've been inspired by someone else's kindness yeah absolutely and maybe you know they didn't stop because they were late for a meeting maybe they were late picking up their kids from school maybe they just didn't notice her because they were in a dream world as so many yeah (laughs) it's all kinds of different things i I I like yeah none of them thought i'm not letting her through yeah there wasn't it there's no malice is there in the kind of neutrality of non-kindness it's not a a bad thing it's just that it kind of ups it from neutral when someone does something really kind yeah love it right I would love to talk for more more hours on this but I'm going to move us on if you're ready for some quick fire questions absolutely let's go for it right let's go for it number one for you personally 
what is always guaranteed to bring you a little bit of work joy? People. <laughs> Definitely people. So, which is odd to say when I, I sort of run my own business and, and spend plenty of time on my own, actually. But I love working with a group of people and bouncing ideas off each other and the, the kind of conversation and the fun that you can have mm. about getting the task done. Brilliant. Love it. Number two, what book are you currently reading? Ooh, so, well, I have just this weekend actually started reading um, the autobiography of Esme Young, who is one of the presenters on the uh, Great British Sewing Bee. Oh. Um, yeah, so I read a lot and I read a lot of fiction, actually. But when I'm not reading fiction, I often will read autobiographies um, because I like stories. And, you know, obviously by definition, an autobiography is somebody's story. So it's I'm somebody's only, story. <laughs> I'm, only, I'm only at the uh, sort of childhood stage. Moment. She's just started kind of doing her first sewing and, and adapting outfits. But, um, yeah, it's very promising so far. Love it. And I also love that kind of it, it links back into your story side of things of uh, reading autobiographies. I've never heard of her. I've never watched The Sewing Bee, so I don't know who you're talking about. But I'm sure an autobiography would well. be a good thing to read, I think. Uh, right. Question number three. What is one bit of advice that somebody has given you in your lifetime that you always find yourself coming back to? Yeah. So I, I gave this a lot of thought. <laughs> <laughs> what do I want to share so I think um uh, one piece that came to, to my mind actually is um years ago when I was trying to decide uh which university to go to and which to have as my first and second choice and I was I was doing the sort of teenage thing of agonizing and going round around in circles and my dad who is lovely but was very much the sort of um speak to your mother about that <laughs> type of, of, of father but he for some reason I was talking to him about it and he said to me nine times out of ten in life you will make the wrong decision but actually it very rarely even if it's the wrong decision is it absolutely the end of the world so mm. don't let indecision be a sort of uh, against progress really uh, you know yes consider things but eventually make a decision and you know something else might come of it actually even if in that moment it feels like the wrong thing who knows where it will lead you that's such good advice isn't it and I'm, I'm sitting here thinking as well it's so true that actually and I, I've gone a bit deep again I've gone down a rabbit hole in my own head about is there such thing as a wrong decision surely it's just a decision you made at that time and then you'll make another one and change something if you don't like it but yeah, again, it's 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 mindset, isn't it? A lot of it is how how you view it, really. And I have to say, you know, this is fantastic advice from my dad. Um, I don't always follow it. <laughs> but I do often come back to it. I do often think, no, come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I get that as well. I don't always follow the fantastic advice I get either, <laughs> or the advice I give to other people. And you're like, sometimes you're like, oh, I should probably follow my own advice there. That's a whole other yeah. conversation. I think. <laughs> That's a whole a totally other <laughs> podcast. Um, right. Question four. Uh, what is one super practical thing that people could go and do now after they've listened to this, do tomorrow, kind of build as a habit that you think would help them get a little bit of work joy in their lives? I think getting outside every day, at least once every day, makes a massive difference. And, you know, whether that be, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate I live um, near um, a really beautiful lake. So um, pretty much every morning I go and I have a walk around that and it just sets me up for the day, you know, gets my, my, my blood pumping and my brain going and, and so on. But even if, you know, you're not, um, you don't have the privilege of, of that sort of space, even if you can just go out on your balcony or five minutes up and down your road, whatever it is, that there is definitely something I think about getting outside getting that fresh air and movement as well that that can make um as i say a, a real difference to kind of get going and, and 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 kind of prepare you open your mind for the day yeah i am 100 percent in agreement with you there and i think actually the research and data would back us up even though we don't feel we need it uh, it would definitely back us up in terms of the getting outside walking 
fresh air, etc. It makes a massive difference. I know for me, if I don't go for a walk in the morning before I start work, I'm never quite as on it. I'm never quite as good. Um, so I think definitely get outside, go for a walk. I know uh, one organisation I used to work with mapped out a mile walk from their kind of office doors, kind of a circular route. And it's such a great thing. And people were doing walking meetings and all kinds of stuff. So definitely definitely worth a go and it's so tempting to stay stuck at our desk whether we're working from home or working from an office or working from a school or working from a factory wherever it is it's so tempting to stay and think that we're being productive but actually we're usually more productive if we step away so give it a go yeah absolutely and and I think you know that just it, it, there's something about just a different perspective as well isn't it which is why I say you know even if you're you know you don't have that privilege of, of a sort of a walk to do or you know you're not able to get out for very long just going standing somewhere else yeah itself can have a bit of a sort of shaking up effect um, for sure which you know and, and find, find your favorite spot <laughs> love it right final question from me is where can people find out more about you and time for kindness and all your lovely work yeah, so um, I have two websites. <laughs> um, so uh, we have timeforkindness.co.uk and that's where you can find out, uh, you can read the stories of kindness that we share. We also have blogs on there. Um, there is also, as of last week, I have just launched a kindness ambassadors scheme, which is where you can sign up. It's a completely voluntary thing. You can sign up to be a kindness ambassador. And what all I ask is that you pledge to notice kindness at least once a week. And for every one that you see, you tell at least one other person about it. I'm not going to check up on you. You know, it's just something I want to put out there for people yeah. getting in that habit and, and, and having the conversation. Um, so time for kindness, if you go to the website, it's got all the social media um, links on there as well. We're on LinkedIn, Instagram and Facebook. Um, and then for my communications work, um, I do that. My business name is Browning York. So browningyork.com is where you can find out all about that. And um, I, as Sarah Browning, I'm also on LinkedIn brilliant we will put those links into the show notes so that people can click straight through and find out more um love the idea of the kindness ambassadors and kind of really spreading the news um through telling people yeah. what a great thing to Absolutely. have um i'm team. totally going to go and sign up marvelous we will be you know oh, you get a digital badge i forgot to say that yeah if you sign up you get a digital badge <laughs> i'm also such a nerd that i love the idea of getting a badge as well so <laughs> absolutely <laughs> to be part of something is, is also exactly <laughs> well sarah thank you so much for coming on the work joy jam it's been a real pleasure to talk to you and i'm really looking forward to sharing this with everybody thank you very much for having me it's been an absolute pleasure well, thank you again to Sarah Browning for joining me on the Work Joy Jam podcast. So many things to think about when it comes to kindness and kindness in our organisations, kindness in terms of what other people do that we notice, but also remembering how kind we can be and really helping ourselves to think more and do more in that space. I love Sarah's idea of being a kindness ambassador and being a person that notices spots and shares and spreads the message around kindness. And it not just being about that positivity side of things, not that false positivity, but to actually use kindness as a way through some of the difficult things that we all experience in life and in work. And I am there also going to give a call out to anybody who has researched anything to do with kindness and linking empathy together and whether those two things can exist without each other um, because I have no evidence to support anything that I've said there I just it, in my head that's where it came from I encourage you all to really think about an experience you've had where you have noticed or given some kindness to somebody and to really think about how do we maximize that in our working lives we also have lots of episodes available on the Work Joy Jam podcast. Go back and have a listen to some of them. I recommended the episode with Janie Van Hool on listening would be a great one to compliment thinking about kindness. Lots of episodes there. Pick a mix. Choose the ones that are great for you. Remember also on the website createworkjoy.com, we have a couple of freebies available. One is a tracker to really understand where you get your work joy from. It's called Work Joy. Where do you get yours? And to be able to understand it so that you can maximize it in your life. And the other one is if you're feeling a little bit gloomy, if you're not really into your work at the moment, we have another freebie, which is called How to Fall Back in Love with Your Job. So have a look there 
uh, at createworkjoy.com um, some things for you to take away and practice with. Speak to you soon.